Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and this is a continuation of my discussion on a fairly recent paper by Knotts and Strove about the trajectories of the Arctic sea ice, combining the best, um, most up-to-date um, information from the observations of the sea ice behavior and the computer model simulations, both from CMIP5 and CMIP6, uh, to come up with numbers for, for when the Arctic sea ice will be gone in summers. And the numbers are pointing to, you know, certainly within the range 12.5 years from now to 27.5 years from now, based on the, both the observations and the models. But, you know, I think it's likely to be quicker. There's other factors that come into play, for example, uh, aerosol reductions, which has been happening, you know, but that's more of a short term thing. Um, and that's due to lower emissions from the, uh, due to the coronavirus. So anyway, I'll get by, right back into the, uh, into the paper, um, which is open source, uh, the trajectory. Okay, so just to recap, um, the trajectory towards the seasonally ice-free Arctic Ocean, knots and strove. Okay, so there's only one figure in that paper, and that's here. So we've got the months December, January through to December, and we've got global warming above pre-industrial levels. This is global mean surface temperatures. Here's where we are today, about 1.1 Celsius. Again, this is to the baseline of 1880 to 1910, add 0.3 to go back even further to 1750, the original baseline. And what this is showing is as the temperature rises, when we get just above 1.5, 1.6 degrees, we can have ice-free Septembers. And this is because of the, you need to add the deterministic number to the internal variability number. And in terms of gigatons, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, 800 uh, gigatons, cumulative emissions, plus or minus 300. So that's a range of 500 to um, 1100. And that's in about, uh, yeah, that, that would be about 12.5 uh, years from now, this point here. And then as you go to higher and higher temperatures, this shows you the parabola, if you like. Uh, so according to this data, and I think uh, you know, this is conservative. At three degrees Celsius, we can be no sea ice from roughly uh, between June, sometime in June to sometime in November. Okay, so, but I, again, I think this curve is flatter here. But this is this is uh, what is presented in the in the paper. So, you know, um, you know, at two degrees here, um, significant. Uh, ice-free conditions. Okay, so this is what we're looking at. This is a very, you know, key, key plot. And it's also showing that, you know, with 1400 gigatons, the Arctic Ocean will be largely sea ice-free from July through October. Okay, so that's these sort of, these sort of conditions. And, you know, this is the, there, there was two cases. This was a less, cons um, this was a less, higher sensitivity case and this is a lower sensitivity case in the in the models okay so um, now it says that the evolution of anthropogenic aerosols could modify it because they're expected to be less abundant well there's way they're, they're certainly much much less abundant due to the coronavirus Okay, but the expected aerosol, the, the aerosol reductions cause additional ice loss relative to the one driven by anthropogenic CO2 emis emissions. So it's another forcing, okay, which can, wrap, which can increase the loss of sea ice. So maybe that would push 12.5 years down to 10 years or 5 years or 8 years or whatever. But you cannot tell, you can't make a prediction on one year because of this internal variability. Okay. Um, now, most uh, studies they, that look, talk about an ice-free Arctic Ocean, they don't look at the warming or the CO2 emissions. They look at the time as a function. It's all a function of time. But time doesn't, isn't really a control variable. The length of time is established by the warming in a given year, which is a function of the cumulative emissions. So that's why this study is, 
really quite interesting because it focuses on those dependencies. Now, internal variability, um, because of the chaotic nature, um, is, is there. So the year-to-year -year variability, you have to consider it to, to come up, and that gives you the range of when we think sea ice coverage will, will disappear. And we can get a good handle on the variability by running these models many, many times. It's hard to get it from the observation to separate the deterministic and, and uh, chaotic aspects, but you can get it from the models by just running the models many, many times with slightly different uh, boundary conditions. And it, so the observed evolution of the sea ice cover is well described by it's a linear combination. You just add together the externally forced trend the deterministic part and the, super, and the superimposed internal variability. Now, of course, the external forcing is changing rapidly. Um, the pre-satellite record of sea ice coverage from 1953 to 79 um, is considered a robust data set. And then the standard deviation of year-to-year -year changes in September, okay, when the direct um, um, components weren't changing that much, it gives you an internal variability of about 0.36 million square kilometers of sigma. And uh, the CMIP models give you a slightly higher uh, variability, 0.43 plus or minus 0 0.12 million square kilometers. So the two sigma, which is 95% confidence of all the data, um, works out to um, an ice coverage. So double these numbers, just about 0.8 six, call it one, less than one million square kilometers for any year for pre-industrial ice coverage. That's the internal variability. Okay, now of course as you decrease sea ice more and more, the internal variability will decrease. So when there's no sea ice, the internal variability drops to zero. That's pretty clear. Um, but this range of internal variability of a million plus or minus a million square kilometers can explain much of the bias in modeled sea ice trends over the past few decades. Okay, it might also explain why sea ice loss has slowed down during summer since 2012 as the ice co cover is re recovering from an extreme event ice loss due to the long term trend line provided by the external forcing. So regression to the mean and it could be changes in the ocean circulation from internal variability, for example. Now, what's going to happen in the future? That's the big question. That's the whole purpose of doing all of these exercises. So internal variability will be superimposed. Now, given the, um, so the externally forced ice coverage uh, based on the mean global air temperature, plus or minus the internal variability, the 1 million square kilometers, um, you can get the uh, likelihood range of, of losing ice. So the temperature at which the Arctic first becomes ice-free will have a 95% uncertainty range from internal variability of plus or minus 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 degrees Celsius. So when you combine those numbers with a temperature threshold of less than plus 2 degrees Celsius for a near ice-free ocean during summer, that's relative to the pre-industrial a year, then this there, 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 so there, this means there's a low but above zero chance to have a near ice-free Arctic Ocean at plus 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming. And there's existing recent studies that also confirm this. Okay, now how does that work out in terms of the uncertainty and cumulative CO2 emissions? Plus or minus 1 million square kilometer internal variability. And if the sensitivity is minus 3 million um, square kilometers uh, per thousand gigatons, okay? Uh, that directly gives an uncertainty range of about 330 gigatons, okay? So if from the 800, 800 plus or minus 300 would be 500 to 1100, okay? So at 40 gigatons of year, a year, 500 divided by 40 gigatons is 12.5 years. 1,100 divided by 40 is 27.5 years. So the uncertainty range is about 15 years. That's why you can't say in this particular year the ice is going to be gone because of this internal variability factor. Now, there is something also called self-amplification. Okay, so not only do you have external forcing and internal variability, but you self-amplification would be like these nonlinear threshold ice effects, tipping points, for example, ice albedo feedback. As we lose ice, the Arctic's darker. 
absorbs more solar energy, loses even more ice. But the evolution so far of the Arctic sea ice cover, according to this paper, and I'm not, I don't think I agree completely with this, um, it's inconsistent, it says it's inconsistent with a, a tipping point. It downplays the tipping points in this paper. Um, and it says that the evolution of the ice has mostly remained linearly linked to the long-term rise in global mean temperature. And I don't know why they don't talk about the Arctic temperature because the global mean temperature with Arctic temperature amplification gives a much higher temperature in the Arctic, and that's the temperature that's immediately decreased in the sea ice. So I'm not sure why, uh, you know, if the, if the Arctic temperature amplification remains the same, that factor, then sure, you get a correlation to global mean temperature. But if that Arctic temperature amplification is changing, that can throw off the uh, correlation. There's also a one-year lag autocorrelation of minus 0 0.5, and that's on year-to-year -year changes in summer sea ice coverage. So that what that means is that after a summer with a particularly strong ice loss, the ice cover usually recovers somewhat in the following year. Okay, um, you know, so in 2012, when we had this really low year, there was a significant recovery. Now, why would that happen? And they talk about... Um, several stabilizing feedbacks. Three of them during the winter contribute to the lack of self-amplification, even in light of the ice albedo feedback. Okay, so the feedbacks that cause more ice loss in the summer can actually stabilize the ice in the winter. And the first thing is, the first uh, contribution is any ice-free parts of the Arctic Ocean more effectively lose their heat to the atmosphere than those parts that remain ice covered during winter. So heat loss from the open ocean is huge, heat loss when there's an ice coverage is much lower because of the insulating effect of the ice. So, so that is one factor. As we lose more and more ice in the Arctic, it can reform much, much quicker in the winter. The second thing is that thin ice grows much faster than thick ice. And again, that's because of the insulation effect. Atmosphere cold, that cold, uh, the heat has to be lost from the water through the ice. And if the ice is thicker, it's a better insulator. So thin ice can have more heat loss. And so thin ice grows much, much faster. And as it gets thicker and thicker, it slows down um, for the same external forcing. So that allows for some recovery of total sea ice volume after any record ice loss during summer. Third, the later the ice cover forms, the thinner will be its isolating snow cover during winter. So if it's forming later and later in the year, there's going to be less snow on it, and the snow is an insulating factor. So these are stabilizing feedbacks that are active only in winter. Okay, so it's kind of a toss-up between the two. Okay, so they don't. Exp so basically, using all of those things, um, they uh, we come to the. Um, you know, but using all of those things, they, that affects the sea ice cover. Now, there's a lot of open questions, okay? Um, okay, so the, more ro the most robust of these insights, we've learned a lot. The most robust of these insights is that there's, um, you know, are from model simulations and observational records. And, uh, you know, we've got, uh, but the trajectory is still, there's uncertainty in the trajectory. We lack understanding of the pathways in which the ocean and atmosphere translate changes in external forcing to their own internal variability. So pathways by which heat is transported to the central Arctic Ocean. You know, there are 11 of the CMIP-5 models showed the heat to melt the ice cover enters the Arctic by the atmosphere. 11 other models showed it by the ocean and only four of them by both pathways. So there's uncertainty. We don't understand a lot of the regional changes that are occurring, the reasons for them. Um, so that involves the dynamics and thermodynamics of the ice cover, okay? Um, and we don't understand uh, many of the implications of the ice loss. Like it affects the atmospheric circulation patterns, the jet streams, and the ridges can bring much more heat up into the Arctic and so on. And the past evolution uh, before satellite records, we don't have a good handle on. So basically, um, you know, <laughs> Uh, so, so basically, and then there's just conclusions here. So, so basically, um, you know, the, the Arctic sea ice cover has and will remain linear related to global mean air temperature in all months. Um, one, we want, we expect a drop 
uh, with global warming of less than two and so on.